Good morning, good evening, everyone. It's an honor for me to be here today with Dr. Sandeep Gupta to talk about mold illness and the launch of his new course, Mold Illness Made Simple 2. To set the stage for our discussion today, Dr. Gupta and I will talk about mold illness for about the next hour, and then Dr. Gupta will respond to some questions at the end of our discussion. If you have any questions, you can ask those right here on YouTube. Dr. Sandeep Gupta is a holistic medical doctor, nutritional and environmental specialist, Ayurvedic consultant, and wellness coach. After graduating medical school, Dr. Gupta worked in a range of public and private hospitals, including several years in intensive care. Like many, his own personal journey with chronic illness shifted his focus, and he now works to support those with complex chronic illnesses, such as mold illness and chronic inflammatory response syndrome, or SIRS. My name is Scott from BetterHealthGuy.com. I've had my own over 20-year journey with mold illness and Lyme disease, and I'm very much looking forward to learning today from our discussion. Dr. Gupta, talk to us about your personal journey with your own health and how that journey led you to making your work in holistic and environmental medicine your focus and passion today. Thanks so much, Scott. And what I might do, if it's okay with you, is just very quickly talk about um, some of the burning questions that are out there in mold illness at the moment, and that people who are suffering from mold illness or suspect they maybe have to work through in order to try and find answers. Is that okay? Sure, absolutely. So very quickly, you know, this, there are quite a few controversies in this field. And so, you know, one of the big ones is what sort of testing should I have done? Should I do the Shoebaker CIRS biomarkers? Or should I do the urinary mycotoxin testing? Or should I do the new serum mycotoxin antibody testing? Uh, is VCS testing useful? Should I have NeuroQuant? Should I have my, my nasal swab tested for Marcon's or is that a waste of time? Is organic acid test worthwhile? Is transcriptomic work, testing worthwhile? Secondly, in the area of actually attending to our buildings, uh, how do I find a good mold inspector? How do I clean mold? Is it sufficient to just use uh, fogging and ozone or is our more deep methods required? A, me a remediator wants to fog our place. Is that safe and effective? Uh, and for treatment, what are the best binders to use? How can I reduce inflammation? Is VIP still used? And should antifungals be used? And then lastly, how can I keep a place mold free? What's the best air purifier to use? Should I use HEPA or should I use a PCO style filter? Should I have my windows open or shut? How do I find a place that's mold safe? So these are some of the burning questions that are out there. And I hope that after this hour today, you'll be feeling a lot more clear. So let's come back to your personal journey and how this became your focus and passion. Great. Yeah. So in 2005, Scott, I had a acute and severe health breakdown mm -hmm. after taking antibiotics for a gut flu while I was traveling in the United States. I came home and had very severe fatigue and headaches and had no idea how to address it. I started by seeing some of the specialist doctors in the hospital where I was working at the time. However, they really had no answers. And that led me into studying the microbiome and really led me to the whole new understanding of how the body is a delicate system which requires homeostasis. And very luckily, I was able to heal myself quite quickly. And that led me on a whole journey of seeking answers through integrative medicine. Beautiful. So for those that may be newer to the concept of mold and mycotoxins or mold illness or biotoxin illness, what we call SIRS or chronic inflammatory response syndrome, can you give us an overview of the condition and then why is inflammation at the hallmark of these conditions? Yes, so this condition, CIRS, stands for Chronic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. And this is a condition that was coined by Dr. Richie Shoemaker around 2010. And really what it refers to is a multi-system, multi-symptom illness that occurs in genetically predisposed individuals on exposure to biotoxins. So as you know, biotoxins are very small particles that we can get exposed to via being in a water damaged building or having a tick bite or being exposed to contaminated bodies of water. Now, in a certain percentage of the population, rather than having a proper immune response, what happens is they get a chaotic and inefficient immune response, which then leads to what we call chronic inflammation. 
And, and chronic inflammation can be understood as being like a silent fire in the body. It's something that really affects all of the organ systems of the body and the manifestations of it can really include any organ system. And so when we say it's a multi-system illness, so for instance, if a person said they just have abdominal pain and bloating, well, that's just one system. So that's not CIRS. If they say that they've just got insomnia and anxiety, again, that's just that's just one system. So that's not going to be CIRS either. But on the other hand, if they say they've got abdominal pain and bloating and insomnia and anxiety and joint pains and muscle pains and skin rashes uh, and a variety of other symptoms, well, that's more looking like it because it's a whole body inflammation process and it affects every organ system there is. So you talked about some of the symptoms that you might see in someone with this multi-system, multi-symptom illness. Are there any unique signs and symptoms that might serve as clues that someone should explore mold illness as a potential contributor to their health challenges? Well, one of the simple things I think, Scott, is, is if you've already explored basic functional medicine protocols and you haven't had success, let's say you've given it six or 12 months and you've done microbiome testing, you've taken the probiotics, you've done nutritional supplements, et cetera, and you simply find that you're not having the improvement that you expect. That's often a very strong pointer towards the fact that there's, there's mold involved. So the second thing is if you've got a multi-system, multi-symptom illness. So basically, if it's much more likely that you're going to respond to basic functional medicine measures if you have a single system illness. Now, if you have something like I described before, with all those myriad of symptoms, it's much more likely that it's going to be mold, or it's going to be CIRS rather. And the third thing would be that if you know that you've had a history of exposure to biotoxins, so you remember having a tick bite, or you remember that there was a building that you lived in that was particularly leaky or had visible mold or musty odors, well, that would be also another indicator that biotoxins are something that you're going to have to look into early in the diagnostic process. What are your thoughts on symptoms like vibrations or non-dermatomal paresthesias? Are those things that maybe are more common in mold illness or SIRS than other conditions? Yes, actually, that's a really good point, Scott, that there are certain symptoms like those ones you mentioned, a vibratory sensation. Uh, some people say el static electricity shocks as well is also one that's fairly specific. And any symptom that tends to get better when you're away from your home would also tend to be indicative uh, of being a biotoxin related condition. Talk to us a bit about the innate versus adaptive immune response and how the response is different under normal, healthy circumstances as compared to those of us that have dealt with chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Yeah, the innate immune response is a very nonspecific immune response, which really takes place in the first two to three days after exposure to any foreign invader. It's, it's nonspecific and it involves a, a number of different white blood cells of the body and it involves cytokines. It's like shooting random bullets around to try and clear any foreign invaders. But then the adaptive immune system is where we get a much more specific and focused immune response. And it usually kicks in at around day three or four, and that should lead to a much more effective clearing of any foreign mm -hmm. invader. Now with CRS, the whole postulated mechanism is that we are unable to have a proper adaptive immune response. And this is because a process called antigen presentation does not take place effectively. And this may well be due to HLA, the HLA proteins of the body and variations in the HLA genes. So as a result of this, what happens is you get a chronically activated innate immune response. And really that's what we mean by chronic inflammation. It is a chronically activated innate immune response. Talk to us about the difference between mold allergy and mold biotoxin illness or SIRS. Can a person have both of these at the same time? And is the treatment of mold allergy versus mold biotoxin illness, is it different? 
Absolutely. So the first, uh, so the first difference is that mold allergy really involves only one small part of the immune system, and it does relate to the adaptive immune system in that you're creating a type of antibodies called IgE antibodies. And generally speaking, those IgE antibodies then go and trigger mast cells and result in symptoms such as a runny nose and uh, rashes and itch and some more mild symptoms like that. In some cases, it can be more severe. And, and result in something called anaphylaxis. However, in many cases, it's more mild and it can be a single system illness. CRS, on the other hand, is, uh, involves many parts of the immune system and it's a whole body process. So firstly, yes, it is possible to have both. You can have mold allergy and you can have CIRS. And the treatment is actually slightly different in that with mold allergy, it's important to desensitize the person to the, to the toxin or the foreign invader. And so the American College of uh, Environmental Medicine has a whole protocol, I believe, for desensitizing sensitization of mold for those with a mold allergy. While the treatment of CRS is something we'll get onto later in this webinar. Beautiful. Yeah, I think that distinction is really important for people to understand. Traditionally, we think of SIRS as originating from a water damaged building. However, Lyme disease and co-infections like Bartonella and Babesia can lead to SIRS. And so my question is, can SIRS occur with Lyme alone or does mold need to be part of the picture? And in those that you've worked with dealing with chronic Lyme disease, how common is it that there is also a mold component? Yeah, so it definitely is possible that tick-borne illness such as Lyme disease can be the only problem going on in, in SIRS. However, really what we've found is that's quite rare. And it, because of the ubiquitous nature of, of water damaged buildings, it appears that, that mold tends to get into the, into the picture in almost all cases of chronic Lyme disease. And it's because people with this illness do develop quite a strong sensitivity to biotoxins through the tick bite and through the infections that have invaded their system. And therefore, the, um, the mold and other microbial um, toxins that are, are in most environments, probably more than 50%, um, all of a sudden start getting in on the act and triggering their in, innate immune system even more so that they grow, so that they develop even greater inflammation than they would have with just the tick-borne infection alone. Yeah, I think that's such an important concept to really understand is for those people that are dealing with chronic Lyme disease, um, not to miss the exploration into the mold component. Um, I unfortunately didn't know about mold when I first was diagnosed with chronic Lyme disease and probably could have um, accelerated my recovery had I understood that earlier. So I think that's a real um, example of where a course like what you're creating here will really help people to understand that connection. Many people think of mold illness as mold and mycotoxins, but in reality, there's this whole soup of toxins, inflammagens, of microbes even in water damaged buildings, many of which we're still learning about how to approach treatment and so on. Talk to us about the range of things that we might encounter when we're in a water damaged building beyond simply mold and mycotoxins and how those might also play a role in the development of SIRS. Absolutely. So when a building is, uh, is exposed to water into the substance of the building for 48 hours or longer, it becomes what's known as a water damaged building. Now, that dampness and that water that gets into the substance of the building attracts a whole host of microbes. And as you say, it's not just mold. It's also microbial VOCs. It's also bacteria. It's also parasites. And some recent research has also suggested uh, mycoplasma and chlamydia may be in on the act. So there's a whole microbial soup. There's also something called actinomyces, uh, which Dr. Shoemaker and his group believe is, is very, very significant. So you're right, it is a whole microbial soup. And often when we talk about mold, uh, we forget that there are many, many other organisms involved. And it's important to keep that in mind. Beautiful. The HLA-DR genes have been discussed for many years as predisposing one to the development of SIRS. What's the latest on HLA-DR and that genetic component, both in terms of serving as a predictor of the potential for the development of illness, but then also as a predictor for response to treatment? 
It's a very interesting area of research, and I hope that more research takes place in the area of HLA uh, haplotypes and CIRS. However, on a practical level, we've found that really these, what were known as the, the SERS positive haplotypes, are so common in the general population that there's really no diagnostic benefit in doing them because they just don't seem to differentiate between cases of CIRS and normal controls. We know that the source or ongoing exposure must be addressed, either removing the toxin from the patient's environment or removing the patient from the toxic environment. Talk to us about the benefits of a mold sabbatical, both in terms of exploring the potential impact of the environment on our health, but then also as a longer term treatment option. A mold sabbatical is where you take some dedicated time off from the building that you're being exposed to on an everyday basis. So a very common way of doing this is to go tent camping for around about two weeks or even longer. The big advantage of this is that you get a clear break from whatever building that you are in. And all of a sudden, uh, what can happen is that your sensitivity of your body in being able to notice subtle symptoms in, on exposure to water damage buildings is restored. The concept is kind of like that if you have a button that's always pressed all the time, then you're not going to notice subtle difference in, in someone pressing the button uh, stronger or weaker because that button's already pressed all the time. And I think that same concept really applies to food allergens such as gluten. If you're eating gluten all the time, and then you go and eat one more slice of bread, well, you're not going to notice a difference because your gluten button is, is already pressed. It's only when you eliminate gluten for probably four weeks or longer that all of a sudden, when you then have that slice of wholemeal bread, you'll, you know, you'll be astounded at how, uh, how strong the inflammatory response is to that. And that was something I experienced myself in, on my healing journey was going off gluten and dairy. And, and just to take a quick sidetrack, when I was working in intensive care, the nurse in that unit, and often nurses know a lot more um, than the doctors in the hospital about, about holistic methods, they would say to me, you know, Sandeep, I've noticed that you've got um, blocked sinuses. Have you considered going off gluten and dairy? And I actually said, that's rubbish. That's nonsense. Um, but I said, okay, I'll do it anyway, just to prove them, just to prove you wrong. And exactly what I just said happened. I went off the gluten for four weeks and then I had a slice of multi-grain bread and I felt like I was choking all of a sudden. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe the, the impact of, of the inflammation from that toxic insult. And so to me, the mold sabbatical is very similar to that concept. It allows you to have the button switched off for a little while. And, uh, you know, while you're doing that, there's, there's a whole host of things you may care to do. Some people may care to start doing limbic retraining um, programs and so on. And, Often what you'll find is that there is some subtle but definite improvement. And then when you're re-exposed to your building, the key thing is to really take note of the symptoms that come up in response to that exposure. And often this can be way more definitive in terms of how that building is affecting your health than any type of environmental test, such as air testing or ERMI. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think we will only ever be as healthy internally as the environment around us, right? If we're constantly every day being exposed to our kryptonite, we will never again regain our superhero status. So it's yeah, really, really I, important I that. that we look at our environment and what we can do to improve it and really optimize our road to optimal health. Let's talk about testing. You just mentioned testing. What are some of the better self-testing methods that could serve as maybe a starting point for someone that's just beginning to explore this journey? And then when should I consider an indoor environmental professional or IEP? Um, when I'm thinking about IEPs, how important is it to find someone that understands SIRS? And then where might I find those types of resources? Okay, it's a very multi-pronged uh, question, but that's okay. I'll try and take it bit by bit. So in ter terms of self-testing methods, uh, there are a number of different options. And the first one 
is actually not to do any professional test, but really just to tune into your senses more carefully. So when you walk around the house, take particular care to notice, is there any visible mold at all? And are there any musty odors? Now, having said that, not having, you know, not having visible mold or musty odors, you know, doesn't exclude the possibility that you have mold. However, if you do notice those things, that's going to be a very strong indicator in and of itself. Uh, the next thing is to really just ask yourself, have there been any water intrusion events in that home in any area? And if there have been, to really go closer and really just see how you feel in those areas and see if there are any subtle signs of water damage. So one subtle sign um, that's distinct from the ones I've already mentioned is that sometimes you'll notice bubbling of the, the walls uh, or, the, or the paint job. Sometimes you'll notice some subtle staining. Sometimes if you have ducted AC or HVAC, you'll notice that there is some subtle signs of mold starting to appear on the HVAC. So all of these things are the, a really good first step is just to make sure you're really tuning in to all the subtle signs, because in many cases, if you really pay attention, you will be able to notice the subtle signs. Now, now moving on from there, the next option can be to do some mold testing plates. And one, one advantage of that is that you can, you know, they're generally quite inexpensive and you can put them in various rooms of your house. And if you see mold growing there, that's a very, very strong visual motivator and a very, very strong confirmation to most people's mind that they have a mold problem in their house. So I think that can be useful. However, again, the thing to know is if the mold plates are negative, that doesn't exclude it. And, and that's probably quite a common theme in CIRS. And so then the next thing to consider after that would be doing an ERMI test. So ERMI stands for Enver Environmental Relative Moldiness Index. It's a type of DNA testing, and it's collected via a Swiffer cloth. And there are various labs who perform this testing, including Micrometrics uh, in, in New Jersey. And so what you do is you collect this Swiffer cloth, you collect dust. Uh, from the house and often that's from places like the tops of cupboards and the tops of white goods and you've got to make sure that there's a certain amount of dust on that Swiffer cloth and then you send it to the laboratory for analysis. When it comes back you'll see there's a whole host of uh, DNA fragments of mold that get tested for. So it includes a number of different Aspergillus species. It looks for Stachybotrys, it looks for Ketomium, it looks for Wallemia, etc. Now, if you notice that there are elevated numbers, so Dr. Shoemaker used to say any ERMI above two is something that you need to look into further. Uh, you may need to, at that point, you may care to then uh, consult an indoor environmental professional. And I can't really emphasize enough the importance of having a good indoor environmental professional. Now, whether they be in more the, the building biologist mold, pardon the pun, or the, uh, or the industrial hygienist, um, there are a range of different shapes and sizes of IEP, but the, the key is to make sure they understand SIRS as a condition and that they understand the importance of getting to the source of water damage in, the, in a building and not just addressing it at a superficial level. And those kinds of IEPs are actually few, um, you know, they're, they're actually only a minority of the IEPs that are out there. Unfortunately, the minority, the majority at this point are more concerned with dealing with it at a, 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 a cosmetic level. So uh, if you're wanting to look for an IEP, there is a list of IEPs at the website for ICI, which is the International Society of Environmentally Acquired Illness. And the website for that is ISEAI. Dot .org and if you go to the IEP section there you, there's a list and 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 I believe that that these IEPs have been vetted by the board of of ICI and they are IEPs who are familiar with SIRS and familiar with addressing water damage at a deep causative level so you can be pretty confident if you get an IEP from this list that they are the a type of IEP that that you're looking for there's a couple of them that I'll make mention of who are very very experienced experienced in the United States and, um, and, and are very much worth consulting. And that includes Mike Schrantz and Larry Schwartz and Greg Weatherman. 
Beautiful. Yeah. And I think that website that you just mentioned, it's also a good resource if people are listening and they don't yet have a practitioner that can help guide them down this path. There's a list of practitioners there as well that are part of this ICI organization. Um, I, in one of our previous conversations, you made the comment that finding a good IEP is as important as finding a good doctor. And so tell us a little bit more about that statement. Yeah, I'll stand by that statement. And because the thing is, if you don't, even if you have a good doctor and you get the correct diagnosis and you get the correct medications, if you don't have a well qualified IEP or indoor environmental professional, then what's going to happen is your house is not going to be properly addressed in terms of the water damage. And if you were to ask me what's the most important step of all in the treatment of SIRS due to water damage building, it is the removal from exposure to water damaged buildings. So if you don't get a well-qualified IEPs, you're not going to properly get removed from exposure. And therefore, anything the doctor does, even if they're the best uh, mold doctor around, nothing's going to be particularly effective because you've got a leaky boat and you're, we're trying to pail out all the water from that boat, but that, that boat's still leaking. So you've got to make sure that the boat, that the leak in the boat has been sealed and then all your, your efforts in, in pailing out the water and repainting the boat are likely to be much more effective. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I, I know historically I've heard people say with the shoemaker protocol that I believe was 11 steps that after you get through step one, which is removal from the source of the exposure, that you're more than halfway there. So it, it really is a big part of the puzzle to, to make sure that we're not having this ongoing exposure. When we talk about IEPs and the fact that there are limited numbers of IEPs that really understand SIRS, maybe there isn't one physically in your geography, uh, virtual consultations is something that's been emerging over the last couple of years. So how might a virtual consultation with an IEP help someone determine their path forward? Yeah, I think virtual consultations can be very, very useful. And there's different kind of protocols, you could say, or different progressions of how you can use it. So one option is, as we said before, you actually do some self-testing, and then you go to a virtual uh, virtual consult with an IEP. The other way of doing it is you do the virtual consult with the IEP first and then discuss with him or her what sort of sampling you could you could do as a self-testing methodology. So one of the things you can do, firstly, the thing uh, that you can discuss with them is their approach. What approach do they take to inspecting and remediating buildings? Uh, how do they identify whether a building is water damaged or not? And often, if you've got a, a, a laptop uh, or a, a good quality iPad, or something like that, you can actually take them around your house and give them a little bit of a tour of the house so that they get an idea of what the structure and, and of your house is. And they can start to think of what the possible water damage issues would be. And they can start thinking of what the best sampling methodologies might be. Yeah, another scenario that I know you've mentioned as well that I think could be helpful is if you have somebody in your area, they can use that virtual IEP as kind of a mentor to then guide the local IEP that maybe doesn't have the full knowledge of understanding SIRS as a condition, can really use that virtual person as a mentor to help figure out your unique personal situation. So I think that's a very interesting option that really has just started to come up in the past couple of years and certainly presents some new opportunities for people. Definitely. Can if can I jump in there you and make bet, a quick absolutely. comment? I guess sure. the main thing I would think there is that there needs to be a level of open-mindedness on the level on the part of the local IEP. If they're very, very set in their ways, uh, uh, you know, that's probably not going to be as successful. So the key is even if they don't have the full knowledge, they have to be willing, willing to open their mind and, and expand their knowledge base. Absolutely agree. Yeah. So if somebody arrives at the place where they need to explore remediation, how important is it that the inspector and the remediator are different people, different companies? It, it's definitely the gold standard. And when the, ins, the IEP or the inspector and the remediator are sep, separate people, it avoids any type of conflict of interest going on. And sometimes subtle, uh, you know, conflicts of interest can be subtle as well. Uh, you know, so I think 
I think that's the ideal way to go. And so let's say you're consulting an IEP, an experienced IEP like, like Michael or Larry by virtual. Often what will happen, let's say they decide to do ERMI and some air testing and so on. And if they're show, you know, if there is shown up to be a problem, and often what you need to do to identify the source of a problem will be using moisture mapping. And so perhaps in, in what might happen in your case as a local IEP may be able to do the moisture mapping. And let's say that they identify that the kitchen has been the problem and that there's been a leak in the kitchen. And um, you know, once the, a full evaluation has been done, generally what an IEP will do is write up what's known as a scope of work for a remediator. And then they will try to contract the correct person, the best person in the area to carry out those works. So very rarely the only person available, and I guess this could happen in small towns. It could be in a very rare case that the only person available is that same local IEP who did the testing. And I'm not saying that that can never happen or that's never appropriate, but I think one should start from the point of view that if possible, it's better to have a separate inspector and remediator. So when we then think about correcting the environment, how important is it that there's an actual removal of the source of the exposure, whatever material was water damaged, does that need to be physically taken out or extracted from that environment? And then where this conversation kind of goes from there is, can we avoid that and use ozone or fogging or diffuse essential oils and completely bypass the need for something that might be more invasive or more costly? Yeah, so it's a great question. And the the answer is it's, it's of utmost importance. You have to get to the source of exposure. The, um, the analogy which, which Dr. Neil Nathan gave last year in Denver, which I'm shamelessly using all the time now, is that if you have a patient with a, some kind of bowel tumor and uh, you've got a surgeon come along and say, oh, that's a, you know, you've got a bowel tumor, but that's okay. We'll go in and we'll, um, we'll patch things up on the surface and we'll make sure that your skin looks really nice. And, um, you know, we, we might do some liposuction while we're at it. <laughs> However, we won't bother going and going and, and actually removing the tumor. <laughs> How confident would you feel in that, that surgeon's approach? Um, it's an extreme example, but I think it makes the point very well. So if you have someone uh, who wants to remediate the home, but not actually remove the, the water damaged building materials, essentially you have not got to the source of the problem. And even if you've temporarily mitigated the problem, you're still going to be that, you know, those water damaged materials are still going to be off gassing microbes into the environment. So when you talk about fogging or ozone or essential oils, yes, in some cases, they may temporarily reduce the mold count, particularly in the air. They may not actually reduce it on an ERMI test because what happens is often the mold will then just go and settle into the dust. So sometimes actually the ERMI test can increase because you're actually, you're actually um, settling more dust and the ERMI will pick up you know, non-living organisms as well. So ERMI will often show that it hasn't been totally dealt with while air samples will improve after you do fogging and ozone in most cases. However, what will happen is then with time Time, the contaminated building materials will again off gas and the problem will be back. So it's really at best a symptomatic approach. And if you're, you know, I, I understand in some cases people just can't afford to do remediation at the current time. And, you know, it's possible in some cases that the temporary use of ozone or fogging could be part of, of a temporary strategy. Or the other things would be to use air filters and to use use good quality air filters to just to keep that environment as good as it can be up until proper remediation is able to take place. We're going to come back to the air filter conversation, but I wanted to drill in a little more on this idea of non-living particles. So I think a lot of times we're thinking about killing the mold in the environment through some of these things that we just talked about, whether it's ozone or essential oils and so on. So if we think about these non-living particles, can they be contributors to the ongoing SIRS condition? And how do we, how do we kind of think about addressing those non-living particles? 
Absolutely. The non-living particles are just as important. And the research so far points to the idea that non-viable particles of mold may be just as damaging for a SERS patient as, um, as living mold spores. And so really the only way of addressing these particles is by removing contaminated building materials and the use of air filters. You're really not going to get anywhere with them through the use of things like fogging and ozone and essential oil. So let's talk just briefly then about the air filtration devices. So these continue to evolve. There's new tools emerging. Some of them are strictly filters. Some of them include PCO purification, sanitization using different types of light. What are the filters that you're finding most clinically helpful with your patients? And can I simply get a good air filter and then bypass some of this remediation? Similar question to what we just talked about with ozone and fogging. Yeah, absolutely. So there's two main types of air filters. HEPA stands for high efficiency particle uh, air and, um, and PCO stands for photocatalytic oxidation. They're two totally different methodologies. HEPA essentially is using filters of various types to try and, and, and block the actual particles from getting through. They get, they, they filter everything above a certain particle size, which is around 0.03 microns, if I'm not mistaken. And then PCO filters, on the other hand, are really using UV light or other similar technologies to oxidize particles and break them right down. And so there's no limit to the size of particles, which PCO filters um, can get to. And sorry, it's actually 0.3 microns, not 0.03, pardon my mistake. So the downside of PCO filters is that you can get some byproducts building up, some oxidative byproducts. And therefore, our experience and recommendation is to use an air filter has, that has a combination of both. One example is the uh, Air Oasis iAdapt. And there, as far as I understand it, there are various other models on the market. I haven't really tried them. There's also a particular air scrubber that's been produced by Air Oasis, um, which is a larger unit called the 280 Air Scrubber, which has both a HEPA and a PCO filter. That's what I personally use in, in my bedroom. Um, however, in some cases, uh, using just a HEPA device can be useful too. And one brand that, that I've used quite a lot of is the Innov Air. Beautiful. There is some debate about the potential for mold colonization in the body after exposure to water damaged building organisms. So how is colonization different from infection? What is the potential for internal, primarily sinus and gastrointestinal colonization of these organisms? And then can that lead to internal production of mycotoxins, even when maybe we've now fixed our environment or moved to another environment? Can we essentially have a mycotoxin producing factory in the body? Yeah, great question. So mold colonization is more where we just have a very localized presence of a certain organism. And infection is where we actually start to get invasion of that, uh, that organism into surrounding tissues and into the body in, gen in general. And really, it's where it's infection where we generally start to get a range of different symptoms and mold infection is definitely something that exists. It's been well described in the medical literature. Uh, there's something called rhinosinus uh, fungal infection, which has been well described. And, and it's, it's known that in patients with rhinosinusitis, which is infection of the nasal passages and the sinuses, there's a very, you know, very great proportion of these patients who test positive for fungus on their on their specimens and therefore it's likely that fungus is part of the etiology in many cases of rhinosinusitis and also in many cases of gut infections there's also fungus that may show up on various different types of sampling, whether that be on the GI map type of PCR testing, or whether that be on various types of culture testing. Uh, it can be candida and various species of candida in, in, in certain cases, which is more of a yeast than a mold. But then there's also mold uh, infection or colonization in the lungs. And it, it's, it's well known that there's a condition called pulmonary aspergillosis, where you have the aspergillus species of mold colonizing into the lungs. 
and it can be very severe in some cases. So it most definitely exists. Uh, probably the gold standard is to, to do an actual sputum sample of the lungs or to do an actual sinus washing of the sinus passages if you, you know, and, and do special um, culturing for fungus. However, it's actually very difficult to pick up fungus on, on culture. Therefore, other methodologies such as the organic acid test uh, are being used more and more commonly. And, and the, the organic acid test on the first page, there's a range of different markers there. However, the, the aspergillus markers, you know, are often elevated, I find, in cases where people have significant sinus congestion on a chronic basis. And I do think that really means that antifungals of some type, whether they be herbal or whether they be pharmaceutical, should be considered as part of the treatment program. So there you're referring to the oat from Great Plains and things like markers two, four, five, and nine, for example, correct? Yes, exactly. Thanks for being more specific on that. And it's, it's more what we call the furans. And uh, the, uh, the furans are basically a, a range of different markers which become elevated in the presence of aspergillus and other mold species. So the original MIMS-1 course goes into great detail about the SIRS blood markers, how to interpret them. All of that material is part of the uh, MIMS-2 course, been expanded. I want to talk a little bit about some of the new testing concepts that have been introduced in the MIMS-2 course, and specifically the urinary mycotoxin testing. So there is some debate on the usefulness of urinary mycotoxin testing, the possibility of positive or high levels being normal excretion, potentially from exposure to various food sources that might be contaminated with mold or mold toxins. So talk to us about your perspective in terms of the value of urine mycotoxin testing. Okay, great. I do have actually a slide here that may help to answer this question. So I'm just going to pop that up quickly. Beautiful. Uh, and just, just share this idea and really just, just tracking backwards for a moment. If we just go back to the idea on how water damage building exposure causes illness, you can get water damage in a bathroom due to poor waterproofing, which causes microbial growth in the bathroom or the rest of the house. And as we talked about before, one of the ways of inspecting a home is through a do-it-yourself test or a full IEP inspection, which may indicate water damage or amplified mold growth. So that's often one of the first places to go in terms of testing. And I've talked about the fact that one of the key diagnostic things first is to ask yourself if you have a multi-system, multi-symptom illness. Now, if you don't have a multi-system, multi-symptom illness, you may still have problems with mold. I'm not saying that you don't. It's just that it's unlikely to be the classic illness of SIRS. So then when we get into testing, we have what we call direct testing. So direct testing really means we're actually testing the thing that we we worry about directly. And so therefore the urinary or nasal mycotoxin testing can be done through three laboratories. It's Great Plains laboratories, vibrant labs, and also real-time laboratories. And real-time laboratories, by the way, are the ones who, who also do a nasal mycotoxin test, which is another test that you can do if you've got chronic sinus congestion. So this testing really shows up um, a range of different mycotoxins in the urine. Now, there are different methodologies. There are some, some authors, such as Dr. Neil Nathan, have been advocates of provoking the test using uh, glutathione and also saunas and so on. And, and that may be more likely to, to show up various mycotoxins in the urine. I believe he's only recommending that now for real-time laboratories. That's correct, yeah. So if you do this testing, the key to know, firstly, is that you know, you're, you're only gonna be seeing those mycotoxins in the urine, which you are excreting. So uh, firstly, a negative test doesn't exclude the possibility that you've got mold in the tissues. It simply shows that you're not excreting mold right at the moment. So one of the things I will say is I don't recommend the use of urinary mycotoxin testing to establish whether, has, whether there has been mold exposure or not. I think for a practitioner, you really should be taking that from 
the history. And generally speaking, you can tease that out in the history reasonably easy by asking about whether there have been water leaks and whether there have been musty smells and whether there have been buildings that a patient has been exposed to in which they didn't feel so well. So once you've established all of that, in my view, the role of urinary mycotoxin testing is firstly to see how well the patient is excreting mycotoxins and secondly, to see which exact pattern of mycotoxins um, is, you know, is being encountered in that patient so that you can tailor the toxin binders to the mycotoxins that are showing up. And also in, in the new precision detoxification of mycotoxins, which has been developed by Dr. Neil Nathan and Emily Givler and Beth O'Hara, they've also described which um, detoxification pathways are involved for different mycotoxins mycotoxins and therefore you can decide which exact detoxification support you may want to choose. The thing to know is that, you know, it's going to be almost all cases are going to show ochratoxin A we've found so far, uh, particularly if you're using the Great Plains testing and therefore using either cholestyramine or Wellcol or charcoal is going to be indicated in most cases. However, if you then also see some of the rarer mycotoxins such as aflatoxin and zearalanone and so on, that often indicates that you're going to need to use a alternative binder such as bentonite clay. And I think it suggests the urinary mycotoxin testing has suggested that the use of just cholestyramine and Wellcol on its own is probably insufficient for the long-term treatment of SIRS. So it can be very useful for that. And then, as I said, you can decide on which, which kind of detoxification support you may want to choose. So if you've got ochratoxin A, we know that includes the or that involves rather the glutathionation and glucuronidation and amino acid conjugation pathways. And therefore you can support the patient through the use of either glutathione precursors such as NAC or glutathione itself. And then using glucuronidation support such as calcium deglucurate supplements can be very helpful. And then using amino acid support such as glycine um, can be very helpful. And that's also gonna greatly help with the detoxification of glyphosate. So I know that was a long answer to that part, um, but really it's, it's definitely got a role. However, I think it's important not to just use it as a rote. You know, sometimes in functional medicine, I think the, the tendency can be just to jump and do a raft of, of tests. And I, I think it's very important to do a very thorough history and then to know what specifically you're trying to get out of the, out of the test. And for the urinary mycotoxin testing, um, I think those are the key things. Yeah, and I think to your point, um, if you're doing urine mycotoxin testing uh, and subsequently doing another one four to six months later and it goes up, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? It could be that you weren't detoxifying or excreting previously. Now your body's better able to excrete things. So there is some skilled interpretation of these tests that needs to occur. I personally have found them very helpful in my own journey, but that's with someone who really understands the potential that a worse result is not necessarily bad news. And that to your point, sometimes you could have a false negative early on if you haven't provoked or haven't supported the detoxification and drainage pathways appropriately. Yeah, that's right. I think I think it's important not to just use it in a very simplistic way where you say C mold equals bad, no mold equals good. It's probably a lot more, more, more complicated than that. Yeah. And so my next question, I think you, you really covered in, in some of that response, but in in general or more broadly, can the natural binders be helpful in moving a patient forward? Or is it important that there is a pharmaceutical binder as part of a protocol like cholestyramine and Wellcall, for example? I think current experience has shown that natural binders most certainly have a role. And for some patients, that's the only thing they'll be able to tolerate. And I have most definitely seen people move forward with natural binders only. I do think that cholestyramine and Wellcol overall are stronger. And I think they do have a role, particularly in the case of, of people who are still being exposed. I find it's more difficult to probably be able to mitigate that situation through natural binders. However, I think generally speaking, they're better to use shorter term. And in the long term, I think it's, it's, it's a better thing to use natural binders. 
Beautiful. Yeah, that's a great answer. Let's talk a little bit about VIP or vasoactive intestinal polypeptide. That's often been perceived as the end goal or the holy grail of treating SIRS. Where does VIP fit into a SIRS treatment protocol or SIRS discussion today? And is it something that people must do to regain their health? Uh, vasoactive intestinal polypeptide is a type of neuropeptide which often becomes lowered in CRS. Uh, and there's a number of symptoms that's associated with that. Um, however, the key is that when you have low VIP and also MSH is another neuropeptide which is often low in CRS, you tend to tend to not be able to control the inflammation in your body. And therefore, as you said, in the Shoemaker protocol, the, the cherry on the top of the pyramid was um, VIP nasal spray treatment. And, and uh, you know, I know that for a, for a period of time, people were, you know, very impatiently waiting to get to the step of VIP and putting a lot of their hopes in, in VIP as, you know, basically returning integrity to their inflammatory pathways. And generally speaking, in the Shoemaker Protocol, there's a whole bunch of prerequisites that need to happen before you can get onto VIP nasal spray treatment. That includes having a house that had an ERMI less than two or in the in the more recent um, testing methodologies, having a, a hurts me two less than 11. And then also having a nasal swab, which is clear from Marcon's and then having a normal VCS test, and then also having a normal lipase. In some, some versions of the protocol, Dr. Shoemaker also recommend that, that people have a stress echo and make sure that they're, you know, and have a look at their pulmonary artery pressures. But that's something that's probably, um, probably a little bit peripheral. So generally speaking, it, it does take SERS patients quite a long time to get clear of, of a contaminated environment. As we said, that's actually the most important important thing, not VIP. The most important thing is getting clear of a contaminated environment. And once you've done that, generally speaking, all the natural binders and herbal or pharmaceutical antifungals and anti-inflammatory treatments all tend to work much, much better. And VIP really fits in the category of anti-inflammatory treatments, in my view. Um, I found that certain patients will have a very, very good and sustained response to VIP and others won't have any response whatsoever. And I think it just comes down to individual physiology. It's definitely not something people must do. And I don't think people should pin all their hopes on VIP. It's just one possible option. And you know, if, if for whatever reason you're not able to take it or it's not available in your area, I think at one stage the availability with the FDA was being challenged. Luckily, that seems to have been fought off for the moment. Um, however, I, it, it's, it doesn't have to be done if in your case through discussion with your practitioner it's decided that vip should be trialed then it, it may turn out to be something that's quite useful in your in your case however there have also been many other cases in which people have recovered totally without the use of vip yeah, and you mentioned Dr. Shoemaker several times. I think it's a good uh, opportunity to honor him for his contribution to this whole space. I know we both appreciate him, and I know my own health would not be what it is today without the ideas and concepts that he's put out into the field. So thank you to Dr. Shoemaker. You, yeah. At a high level, what do you recommend for the average mold patient in terms of testing and treatment? Is there kind of a basic approach or strategy that's emerged from all of the work that you've done? Yeah, so this is leading on further from, uh, from the question on urinary mycotoxins, and I might just pop up that same slide again to try and illustrate this even better. So when, when we talked about direct testing, I already talked about the urinary and nasal mycotoxin testing, but in some cases, fungal stool testing can also be done, and also nasal fungal and bacterial culture. These are really to help answer the question of, is there fungal contamination, or sorry, fungal colonization rather, taking place in the body. And I think that's an important one to answer. Uh, the other thing, as we've already alluded to, is the organic acid test. And um, so in terms of what testing you should do, I think one of the big questions to first ask is, does your insurance, um, does your insurance policy cover tests such as the um, Quest and Lab Corp biomarkers for 
um, for TGF beta and C4A and MSH and so on. If your insurance policy covers it and, and your, your practitioner is an MD or DO or someone else who's able to charge on insurance, to me, that's a little bit of a no-brainer no because it basically it gives you important information. It's useful information and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't cost anything out of the pocket. I think that's that's a pretty simple decision, you know, decision point there. Now, the next thing after that, generally, after the, the next test I believe to be the most important is the organic acid test. The organic acid test really gives a broad range of, of, of information. It tells you whether you may have fungal colonization. It tells you whether you may have bacterial or clostridian contamination. And then one thing we haven't talked about that's very important is oxalates and the presence presence of increased oxalates. So if, you know, oxalates can really be considered to be a, a, a secondary mycotoxin. And, and really, I learned all about mox, oxalates from uh, Evely, Emily Givler last year in Denver, and it really opened my eyes. And since then, I've been looking at them in, you know, with a lot of interest. And I do believe they're very important and, and overlooked often in mold illness. So, so that's another thing you can look at in on the organic acid test. Often you find there are a range of nutritional deficiencies that are taking place, particularly if someone's got fungal colonization and an excess of oxalates. So the organic acid test can be very, very useful. The, as I said, the urinary mycotoxin testing is also quite useful. And we're now using the, uh, the serum, uh, the serum mycotoxin antibody test, which is being offered by my Myco lab. And it appears that the most, um, the most beneficial use of this particular test is in determining whether there's current exposure going on, particularly in those who have had their home tested and there's nothing coming up. It can be a way of, of testing whether they could be getting exposed somewhere else. Let's say it's in the gym that they go to every week. Let's say it's in their car. Sometimes that there can be these incidental mold exposures, which are kind of ruining the whole show. And sometimes the clue to that could be in doing a my micro lab test. It's still something that we're quite new to utilizing, but I believe that may well be its role. The next thing that we look at, and particularly in legal cases, is neuroquant. Uh, Neuroquant is a type of volumetric analysis of brain MRI, and it's offered by Cortex Laboratory in San Diego. However, you can have it done with a range of different imaging companies around the world who have set up their software correctly so that they can send the images from a brain MRI to Cortex Laboratories, and they give you a, uh, a range of different reports, which includes what's called a age-related atrophy report and a general morphometry report and a triage brain atrophy report. And based on those reports, you can get an idea of which parts of your brain have become shrunken or enlarged due to inflammation. And that can really be a very strong motivational tool for recovery. And it can also be an important pointer towards the fact that limbic system dysfunction is taking place and one needs to do limbic system retraining programs. And um, I'll take a moment to speak about those and what they are. But basically, limbic retraining programs are systems where you regularly work on, on different practices to calm down this part of the brain, which some people refer to as the reptile brain or the animal brain. And it's really got to do with very primal anxiety responses that get triggered by biotoxin exposure and also just by the whole trauma of the SERS event. So the Neurocon will often show um, swelling in areas of the limbic system, such as the, the thalamus and the hippocampus and amygdala. And that can be a strong pointer that one needs to, to do limbic system retraining. The most well-known programs for limbic system retraining are what's known as DNRS or dynamic neural retraining system, which has been developed by Annie Hopper. Uh, and secondly, the Gupta program, which is uh, my namesake, Dr. Ashok Gupta in the UK. Uh, 
who's a, he's a great guy, and he he also refers to it as the amygdala and insula retraining system. And so I believe any Hopper system is more delivered either by face to face or by DVDs. And the Gupta program is mainly online. They they both of them have a cost of somewhere between three hundred to five hundred US dollars, and I found that it's a very very worthwhile investment. So let's see, I think you had uh, one slide here as well on kind of the basic approach to treatment. Maybe we can talk about that for a brief moment before we yeah. move on to a couple other questions. Okay, great. Thank you. So as we've already talked about treatment for, for to a large degree, and I'm just going to, again, emphasize the fact that removal from water damage exposure is very, very important. And, you know, if you're not sure you're getting exposed, one thing you can do for free is to do a mold sabbatical. And the, as we said, the mold sabbatical will often tell you, once you then re-expose yourself to the building, it'll often tell you whether you are reacting to your particular home and therefore will tell you whether more efforts need to be put in to remediating or relocating. So that's, that's number one. And I think that's the most important, as we've already said. The second thing is toxin binders. And we've already talked about the fact that cholestyramine and Wellcol are probably the most strong binders. And But we've now got other natural binders such as charcoal, bentonite clay, zeolite, chitosan, and the list goes on and on. And there's also a range of different toxin binders mixes. So there's one called uh, Toxies Bind, for instance, which is from Beyond Balance. There's Ultra Binder, which is from Quicksilver, and there's a range of other ones. And I think the key is that you need to be on at least two different toxin binders. But in many cases, having three different toxin binders is is, off, is a good idea because you're there going to have then going to have a broad net in terms of the different mycotoxins that you're able to capture. So this is a really important uh, step. And I'll also add to this that you know that detoxification support is very, very useful. If you're using toxin binders, you need to make sure there's enough bile being secreted by your liver and gallbladder. And one thing that can help that is the use of um, collagog herbs or coffee enemas. If you're doing coffee enemas regularly, that's going to greatly help with the excretion of bile. And then use, use of supplements like I discussed before with things like calcium deglucurate and glutathione and glycine may also greatly enhance the uh, detoxification capacities of your liver. So then moving on to step three is Marcon's or fungal colonization really taking a much more broad view of the nasal biome now and not just thinking of Marcon's as um, the ultimate enemy and really just thinking of, of disruption of the nasal microbiome on the whole. It may well be that for some people, Marcon's is a significant factor in their dysbiosis. And in other people, it may be more fungal, the, the, uh, the type of dysbiosis. And therefore, using natural agents has become much more the go-to. And using in colloidal silver and or EDTA or even antifungal medications such as nystatin or amphotericin nasal sprays has been used. But then also using nasal probiotics, once you've done the killing, appears to be a very holistic way of doing things. And the more recent way of looking things is at looking at this issue is that Marcon's may not need to be eradicated totally. It just needs to be addressed to some degree. And it's possible it may not be able to be eradicated totally. And um, really, we don't focus on that totally, but we just really focus on bringing balance back into the nasal biome. And then in the gastrointestinal tract, really the, the protocol is very similar. We use herbs, we use antifungal medications when needed. We really emphasize the importance of a low sugar and low carb diet. For some people, ketogenic is very useful. And then the use of prebiotics and probiotics, ideally guided by a microbiome test. And um, all of those things together can, can lead to a very good outcome on a gastrointestinal level. And then lastly, we have inflammation correction. So we want to try and reduce neuroinflammation particularly, and that's using things like fish oil or other types of omega-3 oils, a low amyloids and, and anti-inflammatory diet. Uh, resveratrol and curcumin are very important. 
So limbic system and vagus nerve support, one thing I didn't mention about them is they actually reduce inflammation in the system. And therefore, I believe that they are a very, very important part of the treatment protocol for most people. And then we have increasing neurogenesis via the use of VIP. And then there's a nasal spray called Synapsin, which contains a NAD precursor called nicotinamide riboside. Lifestyle factors such as exercise, vitamin D and sun, lithium, lion's mane, bacopa, the list is endless actually. And the other really important thing I'll, I'll add in here is that mast cell activation should be addressed if present. So if that seems overwhelming, um, that is the beauty of this course, the MIMS 2 course is really breaking it down, trying to simplify these concepts. So this is kind of a big overview of all of the different steps that one could go through. There's a tremendous amount of information in the course that really goes much deeper. I, I wanna actually, as we start wrapping up and jumping more into the Q and A from listeners, I wanna ask you a more philosophical question and maybe you can stop your screen share there yeah, so we sure. can get into this one. So. That is, what is the role of illness? And when we go through something like chronic Lyme disease or SIRS or mold illness, is there meaning in our suffering? Does it lead to personal growth or evolution at some level? And would you personally change your own illness journey if you could? That's a great question. And I remember going through mold illness myself in 2014, and it felt like my whole world had come to an end. It seemed like the expenses were never ending. It, it looked like recovery was almost impossible because just getting away from mold was so physically difficult. And I remember at the time thinking that finding meaning through that journey was going to be hard. And for even just being able to get back into a, a lifestyle, which I enjoyed, enjoyed was going to be difficult. However, through that whole journey, well, for me personally, I've learned about CIRS, mold illness, Lyme disease, and other illnesses, and it's absolutely transformed my personal world. And I've seen that for many other mold illness patients, despite how difficult it is at the time, I've found that they can get through this process and find meaning on the other side. And often I've found that there's a lot of personal growth that takes place. And that's been the case for me too. And if you were to ask me personally, would I take away, if, if someone could press the rewind button and 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 just delete my mold illness journey from my life journey would i want to do that i would actually say no at this point i would say no leave it in it's given me so many wonderful benefits and 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 given me so much growth so i hope that's that's encouraging for those to hear who may be right in the midst of it right now, I know it may not feel positive right at the moment, and it may feel extremely overwhelming and um, disheartening. However, hang in there and try and try and see if you can find some clarity in your in you know from this call and and from whichever whichever course you may want to do. But once you can find clarity and once you can, you can get a degree of confidence in a treatment protocol, then try to get and work your way through that. And slowly you'll find that you should be able to recover and get through to a whole, you know, a whole different sense of meaning on the other side of life. And um, I really wish people the best who are suffering from this illness. Yeah, I 100% I agree with you in terms of there are gifts that happen from this journey. I also would not go back if I had that option. I want to ask you um, to kind of end here before we jump into the, the other Q&A piece with giving people some hope. These conditions, mold illness, SIRS can feel so overwhelming. It can feel hopeless. I personally feel like there's more hope now than ever that the, the field is really evolving, that I'm seeing community of doctors and practitioners really working well together. What are some of the things you can share to provide people that are in the midst of this journey with some real hope? What I've seen in, in my management of, of thousands of patients with these conditions is that almost every month, uh, there are new treatment options coming out. And 
there's really an, amus- an amazing um, community worldwide. There are music as well, by the way, um, which, is, uh, which is coming up with all sorts of options. And just the other day, I heard of a new treatment, or just yesterday, I heard of a treatment called Lime N I'd never heard of, and various other different innovations which are coming up all the time. And I think this does provide hope in that we've really got, you can think that there's a group of people all around the world who are trying to break down this area and make it easier. One really uh, important innovation in this field has been uh, the use of disulfiram, I want to mention very quickly. And I feel that gives a lot of hope for tick-borne illness patients in that previously where many people were on herbs or antibiotics almost seemingly endlessly, all of a sudden we've got a tool which seems to be able to be used often for somewhere from nine to 12 months or so. And then in many cases, uh, we, you know, you're able to stop that medication and be able to maintain remission. Somehow disulfiram appears to be taking away the conditions from the human body, which seem to promote the presence of tick-borne illness. And I feel very hopeful now that that solution has been brought in. And I think there's a range of other solutions in the area of mold illness. I think the whole group of um, mold doctors around the world, and I want to give a shout out to uh, Dr. Mary Ackerley and Dr. Jill Carnahan and Dr. Lauren Tessier and various other physicians around the world who are really um, working to make this this protocol and this area of illness easier for patients and making it easier to recover. And I do think it's now easier to recover than ever before, now that we've got a more broad view of mold illness and we have all these tools available to us that we didn't in the past. So there's most certainly hope, a lot of hope for people and I hope you can take that in and feel it. Yeah, and it's actually interesting in the context of this discussion that disulfiram is also antifungal, right? So I've often wondered how much of its benefit is simply Borrelia, Bartonella, Babesia, maybe not Bartonella so much, but um, that arena versus is it also having some effect on fungal colonization? I mean, I think there's a lot to be learned about it, but uh, definitely a lot of things, as you pointed out, the speed at which new tools and new insights and new understandings are happening um, is is really the fastest that I've seen in my 23 years of journeying through this experience. Let's spend some time on questions. I know that you and your team have spent a lot of time connecting people through the various forums and talking with people there. And I want to hear about what are some of the common questions, common threads, that you're seeing when your team's interacting with people in the online communities? Okay, well, I'd like to invite uh, Caleb Rudd to come on at at this moment. He's the uh, technical director of our Lotus Institute of Holistic Health and has been a major, major driving force behind the development of Mold Illness Made Simple. So welcome, Caleb, and would you like to to, um, address this question? Hello, everyone. Um, First, I just want to thank Dr. Gupta for asking me to work on the mold illness made simple back in 2015 when it started out just as an ebook. Um, so it certainly has come a long way since then. Um, but I think with every new test, especially there are a lot of questions and confusion in the mold community. I mean, since the first version, we've had two urine, new urine microtoxin testing, one serum microtoxin antibody testing plus the genie test. Um, and there are no black and white answers. Um, everyone has to weigh up the usefulness and cost of each test with their practitioner and choose accordingly. Um, and environmentally, people are struggling with testing again. You know, it, do you do it yourself, Ermi or mold plate, or do you get a professional to do air uh, spore traps or surface testing? And also the basics of remediation. What is porous and needs to be thrown out and what can be cleaned and kept? Uh, I think people will often need a professional to guide them through both the medical and built environment side. And I think in the course, we just try to show people the viewpoints, the science, and uh, people can choose what resonates with them. Beautiful. Excellent. Thanks, Caleb, for sharing those insights. All right. So let's jump into some questions from listeners. Um, First question is, uh, started consulting with doctors in 2017, not making any headway with mold treatment. What are some of the things that I might be missing 
if I'm still in too much mold, could this make me unable to tolerate binders well? What about viruses or reactivation of retroviruses? Is there a higher up issue that needs to be tackled before mold? Okay, well, obviously, this is a little bit difficult to answer, given that I haven't seen any of your lab tests or gone through your history or anything. But the first thing to think about if you want to address mold as a possibility is could you be living or working or driving in mold? So uh, it's important to address not only your home environment, but also thinking about your work environment, assuming that you're working somewhere separate from home. And I know many people aren't right at the moment, and also your motor vehicle. So so if you have uh, a hidden source of mold, that's most definitely going to be a block uh, to responding and to improving. And it also could make, mean that you don't tolerate bind as well. That's quite right. And uh, it was also taught by Dr. Shoemaker that one common subtype of patient which don't tolerate bind as well and get something called intensification is those who have tick-borne infections. So I think it's very important that you look into tick-borne infections, especially if you've had a tick bite. But the other thing to know here is not all people who have tick-borne illnesses remember a tick bite. And sometimes they can have got those infections from another source. So generally speaking, I think it's important to, to cast the net broadly and to look for that. And then, as you say, absolutely, viruses and retroviruses are something you can most definitely look into. Parasites are something to look into. Heavy metals and then microbiome um, disruption and pyroluria. These are all things we cover in the, the final lesson of the course, which we call uh, bonus module lesson four. And we go into quite a lot of detail. It's also important to just exclude general autoimmune disease. So whether that be things like Hashimoto's thyroiditis or lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera, all of those should be excluded by your physician before we go in and just um, focus in on CRS. Also connective tissue disorder Orders, particularly one called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, is a really, really important one to, to exclude. And, uh, and the other last thing I'll say is if you're not tolerating bind as well, that may point towards the fact that you could have mast cell activation going on. So I would definitely be looking at mast cell activation as a possibility as well. I hope that helps. Yeah, and I think uh, to your earlier point, sometimes in people that are highly sensitive to many things, the limbic system and vagus nerve focus can be really helpful to expand the toolbox of things that you then as the practitioner can use uh, in, in helping them move forward on a more physiologic perspective. So great, uh, great response there. Um, question about... I've heard Dr. Shoemaker say that C4A in range means that mast cells are not at the root cause. I, I've not heard that, but they're asking if you have any insights about the connection between C4A level and the potential for mast cell activation. I know that mast cells can most certainly secrete C4A, so I would say it's less likely if the C4 is in range, but I can't see how it can exclude mast cell activation. What Dr. Raj Patel and his team have found is that MMP9 is probably the more accurate marker out of the LabCorp and Quest panel. And there's also another range of different tests you can do, including serum tryptase, chromogranin A, urinary methylhistidine, et cetera, et cetera. You can also do a serum histamine and serum heparin. So there are a range of different tests and normal C4A would even put in question whether, um, whether SERS is present, but really it, you need to look at all of the different tests holistically with a qualified practitioner and then come up with a, a diagnosis. It's, it's quite tricky in many cases. So the next question, you're in Australia, but um, the question is, why does the CDC have outdated information that is incorrect around toxic mold exposure when hundreds of peer reviewed studies have been proven? So maybe I can just generalize yeah. that to ask, why does it take so long for mainstream sources, medicine, uh, regulatory agencies, why does it take so long for them to start grasping on to these newer tools and solutions that are available? 
That's a really, really good question. And, and the answer I've come up with is what appears to happen in conventional medical circles is that information generally streams down from the older professors. So often the CDC, for example, would get their information from, from one group such as the American Academy of Allergy and Immunologists. And the group of allergy and immunologists have a certain view on mold, which is, how should I say, which is 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 some Somewhat, somewhat antiquated. And basically what those professors generally believe and consider to be the consensus is still generally what goes. And, and there seems to be a reluctance in some cases for these experts to start taking on new information, uh, such as the studies that are published by Dr. Shoemaker or other experts in this field. And I guess one of the reasons is also they generally like to to only take information which has come from the, the mainstream journals, such as the New England Journal of Medicine and the Lancet and JAMA and so on. And in general, it's quite difficult for this information on mold to get published in those mainstream journals because there just isn't the, the same money power to be able to do meta-analyses and randomized controlled trials. And therefore, the types of studies which get published in these journals are, are generally very difficult to produce. So the next question says, regarding the intersection of Lyme disease and SIRS, can you speak to details about the medications or interventions? How would they be prioritized? And is there an ideal ratio of Lyme antibiotics to cholestyramine? So let me just rephrase this maybe and Love say that. in someone that's dealing with chronic Lyme disease, should mold illness be explored and treated prior to getting into Lyme and co-infections. What are your thoughts on the order there? Yeah, I generally feel that it's best to address mold first, but there's no absolute rule, actually. I have found in some cases that starting off with Lyme antibiotics, maybe especially I think that's the way to go if you've got an acute tick-borne infection. That's very different. And so in an acute tick-borne infections, you want to not delay at all, and you want to just directly get onto antibiotics. And actually, that's the only situation these days that I will use antibiotics in general. And for chronic, chronic cases of tick-borne illness, I will generally use herbal approaches and ozone together. And generally speaking, I intersect them in with the treatment for SIRS. And so I generally feel that it's best to get onto binders first. Um, there's no ideal ratio as far as I know it. If you do know it, let me know because I'm, I'm always looking for these ideal ratios. Um, however, yeah, you're often starting at, at bind, with binders would be great. And then and then bring in the, the herbs and the ozone on top of that. There's no need to stop the binders, generally speaking. And then other treatments like VIP can also go coexist with the, um, the use of whatever tick-borne infection treatment you want. But generally speaking, herbal treatments and VIP also go together well. And, and, and many of the other treatments we've talked about, whether they be antifungals, herbal or pharmaceutical, they can also coexist with, with, um, with the Lyme treatment. And, and it's also important to, to mention that if you've got a significant amount of mold toxicity or a significant, and particularly a significant amount of fungal colonization, you really have to consider are antibiotics going to be a good way to go because they're going to tend to increase the amount of fungus in the system by taking away beneficial bacteria from the microbiome. So generally speaking, if there's a degree of fungus to the picture, which there usually is, in my opinion, then generally speaking, I would tend to go more towards the herbs rather than the antibiotics. Now, the exception would be if you've got someone in a wheelchair or paralyzed or MS or whatever, you know, in those cases, I still do think that intravenous antibiotics can have a part to play. So there's no absolute answer. It dep depends on the details of the case. And that's why having a, a very well qualified practitioner is so important. Any thoughts or insights from your clinical experience on the potential role of the PK protocol or the use of phosphatidylcholine in the treatment of SIRS? 
I think there's a lot to suggest that mitochondrial membranes and, and cell membranes in general in the body get damaged through exposure to biotoxins. And so as part of the whole recovery process, using certain supplements such as phosphatidylcholine and uh, some of the other supplements which are used on that process, I think also NAD is used to a certain degree and butyrate. And I, I think that they can be very, very useful um complementary treatments, shall we say. And sometimes I think Dr. Andy Hyman actually uses that first up to just try and create a degree of, um, how should I say, of, of stability of the cell membranes in the body before he starts things like cholestyramine, because it's, it's more likely that those kinds of medications are going to be tolerated once mitochondria, mitochondrial membranes have been stabilized to a certain degree. So I think it can be very useful. Beautiful. So let's touch a little bit more on the MIMS 2 course. We really just touched the tip of the iceberg. I mean, I've gone through all of the slides you've put together. I know there's so much amazing content there. Tell us a little bit more about the course. I know there's also a community that you've put together so that participants can continue to dialogue. And then maybe give us your vision for how you see people using the course. Is it something they can watch and then go self-treat? Is it something where they should still have the guidance of a knowledgeable doctor? doctor or practitioner to guide their treatment? How do you position this course? Okay, great. Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and share the course, the share the slides again and go through this quickly. So MIMS 2 or Moldenless Made Simple 2 is, is really a labor of love. It's, uh, it's been produced over around about three and a half years. And really there's, there's now 17 hours of lectures, which include animated slides. And there are, there are nine modules, so eight basic modules and one bonus modules, which include 30 lessons. It's something that can be completed at your own pace. So there's no pressure to complete it by a certain time because we really want people to not feel pressured Pressured, but just to feel that they can do it in their own, according to their own energy levels and according to their own cognitive abilities, because we know many people with SIRS are not feeling like their concentration abilities and their ability to assimilate information is as good as it could be. And therefore, what we've really emphasized is making the information as simple as it possibly can be. So part one of the course is on the condition of SIRS and also other forms of mold illness. So we also talk about, we also talk about fungal colonization. We also talk about mold allergy, and we also talk about mycotoxicosis from foodstuffs. All of these appear to be important. And so we go through all of the different um, theory points on CRS. So we explain very, very minutely in detail what is inflammation and how do biotoxins trigger inflammation in patients with CRS. And so I hope that helps people to really be able to understand what the illness is in, a, in very simple terms and how they can get onto a treatment protocol. So in part one of the course, we cover an introduction to inflammation and CRS. Secondly, other causes of CRS, sorry, try that again, other causes of CRS besides water damage building. So that includes tick-borne illness, it includes cigatera, et cetera. And then in module three, we talk about screening for CRS. In module four, we talk about diagnosing CRS. And in module five, we talk about SIRS treatment. In part two of uh, the course, we talk about water damage buildings specifically because they are so important. So module six covers mold, water damage and building testing. In module seven, we talk about the basics of remediation. In module eight, we talk about finding and maintaining a healthy home. And then we have a bonus module, uh, which covers using biomarkers to determine water damage buildings. And this is more for interests rather than anything else, particularly for anyone living outside the United States. But it's where, for instance, you can go and do a mold sabbatical and have your blood drawn for C4A and other biomarkers. And then when going back into a water damage building, you can then redraw those biomarkers and see whether there's a significant rise, which also tends to uh, confirm firm the idea that that building is contributing or not contributing to your health problems. In lesson two of the bonus modules, we talk about psycho-emotional stress and trauma, limbic system retraining and vagus nerve 
um, methodologies. And I would say that possibly this is the most important lesson of the whole course. It's actually one hour and 20 minutes. And we talk a lot about why the limbic system gets affected in CIRS. And we talk about what all the different trauma that can occur in CIRS is. Some of the trauma in CIRS is simply not being understood or validated. And this all has a very great effect on the system. And we talk about why limbic system retraining can be so useful and also vagus nerve stimulation. Uh, methodologies. So that's a really important one. In lesson three, we talk about the similarities between SIRS and COVID-19. And uh, those who are listening probably know that severe COVID-19 is in fact a inflammatory illness with a cytokine storm. And we talk about this illness specifically, and we talk about why we don't believe that SIRS patients are at greater risk of, of COVID-19, but there is a protocol there that you can follow in terms of preventative supplements and so on. And then lastly, we talk about other causes of multi-system, multi-symptom illness, and that includes SIBO, it includes heavy metals, it includes pyroluria and parasites and dental problems. Because we really, as we said before, you wanna make sure that you're casting your net widely in terms of what you're looking at in order, to, um, in order to recover from chronic illness. And we want people to have as many clues as possible. And so these are what some of the slides look at on the, on the bottom left-hand side of this, this slide. You can see one slide relating to the serial biomarker test and the version by Dr. Raj Patel. And then on the top, Top right of this slide, you can see there is uh, one regarding building materials and a decision matrix on what to do for non-porous, semi-porous and porous building materials. And I actually feel just the, the section on dealing with water damaged buildings, if you take, if you only take that part of the course, I believe that the, the cost of the course is warranted just for that alone, because making mistakes in that whole domain can be very, very costly and frustrating. And if you can get the right information to start with, so for instance, getting a, a proper IEP and making sure you dispose of any porous materials, et cetera, then you've got, you know, you, you basically got the right information there and you're going to do the right things that are going to promote your recovery and not make silly mistakes that people like me make in their recovery from mold illness by not getting rid of all of their possessions when they move house. So there's a whole, really, there's, there's, a, there's a huge amount of information in this course. And you can you don't have to do it in a linear fashion. You can go and and do the, the bonus module um, first, if you like, and then, you know, go through the different modules at, at, you know, in various different orders. There is a quiz, which is optional at the end of each module. And for those who complete all the quizzes, you get a completion certificate. So, uh, you know, we really want people to make, you know, to be able to access this material and make best use of it. And, and for that reason, we are offering a 33% launch discount. The coupon is MIMS two year. And I think that's <laughs> Caleb's sense of humor. Very creative. <laughs> And so we've discounted it down from $299 to $197 for the next 48 hours. Uh, so the, the website is moldillnessmadesimple.com. And if you go in into that website and 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 click on join and then put in the coupon MIMS2, yeah, you should be able to access discount. It's important to note that existing students will get a special offer emailed to them uh, as to how they can upgrade um, to the new version of the course. I also want to mention that we have a special Facebook group, um, which is going to be very useful and where people can, can ask questions and make comments about the course and the material they will have gone through. So really in closing, I want to say that, that the main intention behind this course is to provide clarity and hope. I hope this webinar today has helped you to attain more clarity and hope. And it's, it's my utmost wish that people with this illness can find the, the solutions they're looking for and move towards recovery. We've got Beautiful. more webinars and blog posts coming soon. So please subscribe to our website at moldillnessmadesimple.com and also to Scott's at thebetterhealthguide.com. And I want to say a big thank you to Scott for, for performing this launch and being such a great interviewer. 
This has been a highly informative discussion, Dr. Gupta. I personally appreciate all that you do to help those of us that are really impacted by these conditions. I know your heart and how hard you work to help those of us that are struggling with mold illness and related conditions. So just wanna thank you for sharing with all of us today. Thank you to everyone that's attending, best of health and take good care, everyone. Bye everyone. Okay, it's done.